I'll read Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8, all together. And then we will ask the Lord to bless the preaching of the word. And I will give a message from Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word to the souls of your people. And now we ask that you will bless the preaching of your word through the means of this technology to those who may see and hear May you be glorified. By the power of your spirit, may you deal with the souls of any in in its hearing. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Psalm 21, really in its main theme, answers one question. When there are troubles and difficulties, where does our help come from? When there are troubles and difficulties, where does our help come from? This is an important question because really in all of life, we know there are troubles and difficulties. They seem to be all around us all the time. We, we look at the last nine months or so and it seems that there's more troubles, more difficulties than we ever could have imagined. Things happening all around us that we really couldn't have conceived of some years ago. We think about the politics in our country, and we're troubled. We think about the politics in our state, our local communities, and we're troubled. We think about it in the world around us, and we're troubled. We think about the health of people all around us, and we're troubled. We think about the words that people are spouting off everywhere and we're troubled. We think about what young people are being taught by the culture and we're troubled. We think about the troubles of even our own families, the issues of our own families, the difficulties of our own homes, and we're troubled. In one way, trouble seems like it's everywhere. (laughs) It's all over the place. One difficulty after another. And in verse 1, this is the place where the psalmist starts. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? Well, he uses the identification of the mountains in two ways. Number one, he uses them to identify our troubles. What are the troubles? Well, the troubles are the mountains. The troubles are of the highest of difficulty. He looked to the mountains and knew to cross them it would be very difficult. Sometimes you stand and you look at the mountains and you say, wow, they're beautiful, they're glorious. Have you ever seen uh, the, the peaks of the Appalachians or, or the peaks of the Rockies or Mount Rainier or, or some great mountain, Mount Everest, something of that nature? You, you're just in awe of it. And yet, 
To be in awe of it in its beauty is one thing, and yet to be in awe of it to try to cross that mountain is another thing. When you began to try to cross that mountain, that highest peak, you know that it's going to be a journey with great difficulty, great trouble. This is the view of the psalmist. He will lift his eyes to the mountains and he says, when I see those mountains, where will my help come from? Where is it that it will come from? One writer gives us the indication that the mountains are more the menace here than they are the beauty. We can have this idea and understand that this is the way the psalmist is thinking because later he will say, he will not allow your foot to slip. Well, the mountains are only a problem when you're on them and you're climbing them and you're concerned about the next step and you're at the steepest places and you're worried about, will my foot slip? It's one thing to have your foot slip when you're on level ground. It's another thing to have your foot slip when you're on the the face of a mountain that's uh, 8, 9, 10, 12,000, 14,000 feet high. The mountains here represent the troubles and difficulties of life. And they seem to be all around us. Any trouble we could name... But most of all, it's the troubles of the highest difficulty. When we have the troubles of the highest difficulty, when we're concerned that if our foot might slip, that we may fall to our death, there's a question. Where will my help come? Now, it's important to note, first of all, that the psalmist here is asking this on behalf of a certain people who are in trouble. It's the Lord's people. And so when he brings this question up, it's a question of who will help the Lord's people. Firstly, what are the troubles? The troubles are of the highest difficulty. They're of the greatest magnitude. And we could look around and name those troubles and just keep naming them and naming them and naming them. Secondly, it's who is in trouble, and it's the Lord's people. And thirdly, it's who will help the Lord's people. And this is the second way that the psalmist looks into the mountains. He looks high up because he knows the highest of difficulties can only be dealt with by the highest of beings. And so he says, in this vein, who's going to help the Lord's people? He says, my help comes from the Lord. What Lord? What what God? It's the Lord who made the heaven. This is why he can look up past the mountains. The Lord who made the heaven. He looks all around. The mountain in and of itself has become more than just a, a, a vision of a sight in beauty. The mountain, because he's on it, has become treacherous. Just as life is every day, it's treacherous. There there are things out there, even, even when there's not all the difficulty of the present world, there's still things that are treacherous. Who's going to help the Lord's people? The Lord who made the heaven. He made all of the universe. He made all of those things. Things that we haven't even seen yet. He made all the things that scientists don't even know exist. They're out there. There are things in our own oceans that we know little of. And so he says, not only is the Lord who made the heaven who will help his people, but the Lord who made the earth. There are so many things we're still learning about this very earth we live on. In one sense, we can't say that science is going to help us with absolutely everything because at the end of the day they're not the Lord they're not the makers of heaven and earth scientists are the discoverers of the order that God has given 
So as believers, our ultimate help is in the Lord. The Lord who made the heaven and the earth. This tells us a lot about his being. It tells us about who he is. Because furthermore, he says, it's the Lord who will not sleep or slumber. In verse 3, it's a, a context of, uh, of, as one writer says, the word not here is more the idea of request. He will not allow your foot to slip. It, it's more of request. He who keeps you will not slumber. Is it this one who will do this? Please let it be this one. And the psalmist reassures the people of God in verse 4, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. God is omnipresent. He is eternal. He does not sleep or slumber. He does not change. Does it even have emotional equivocation. He doesn't go back and forth as if he were frantic. He's the Lord who will not slumber. He's always who he is. There's not a moment he's napping. This is the Lord who will help his people. The one who made the heaven and earth. The one who will never sleep nor slumber. The one who's always working out the purpose of his plan. He planned a people. He planned to save a people. And he planned to keep those people. Well, our fourth question, how does the Lord help his people? Well, the Lord will help them because he will not allow your foot to slip. The request is being made in verses 3 and 4 that your foot would not slip. In verse 4, there's reassurance. Why do we know that he will not allow our foot to slip? Because he does not slumber. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at once. There is never a time when God is not. He is. This fact that He is ought to give us encouragement that there will never be a slipping of our foot away from Him. This is due to His power and might. He is all-powerful. He's all-powerful to... Not only create, but to order and to purpose. And all these things in providence are a part of what he's done. There's absolutely nothing that's outside of him. Not even one molecule of of anything whatsoever. You've heard it many times before. You've heard it from others. You've heard it from me. There's absolutely not one single molecule that does anything outside of the purpose of and power of God. Why do we say it again? Because we need to be reminded. We need it. We need it each and every day for everything that goes on. When I use the word we, I I mean it. I, I need it too. There are moments when you see and know and hear things that your own mind slumps. But is it not the Lord who created the heaven and earth, who will not slumber? Is it not him who will keep his people in his power and his might? The Old Testament is full of an understanding of God purposing his people and him giving his commandments to his people, his people disobeying and God continuing to deal with his people. There's nurture, there's Uh, There's discipline. There's God holding them accountable. There are times there's God dispersing them or or, 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 putting them out throughout the whole of of, uh, the earth. And yet it's God always the one bringing them back in. 
by His power and His might. It's God that's the one that's protecting His people. He doesn't just keep them and keep them from slipping away from Him, but He protects them from the treacheries of day and night and coming and going. Verse 5, beginning there, it says, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. But notice what he says. He will keep your soul. It's not saying that evil won't come against your body. Because The very dying of our bodies is evil coming against our bodies. And yet at the end, it's God who protects our soul. He keeps our soul. This is the events of the fall. This is the the, the evidence of the fall. This is the outworking of the fall that there will be evil against our bodies. There will be evil against our minds. It will be perpetrated from those on the outside and it will be perpetrated from the very flesh of our bodies itself. And yet in the end, it will be God who will keep our soul. He'll protect us from all evil. It may be evil in the moment or it might be evil for all time. In its ultimate sense. God protecting us day and night, coming and going. The sun itself can beat down on us. And the imagery is that it, treacheries and difficulties and troubles happen in the day. Troubles and treacheries happen in the night. These difficulties can come at any moment, at any time. Evil can come at any moment, at any time. It is around and it is everywhere. And yet it is the Lord who will keep our souls. We know He keeps our souls through His sovereignty. The sovereignty of His election of many throughout all time, space, and history. The sovereignty of working out the purpose of that election through the sending of His Son, His Son's perfect life on this earth, the Lord Jesus, His death on the cross, His shedding of His blood and His death on the cross. The very resurrection of our Lord on the third day. This is an outworking of that very purpose of God to keep our souls that those who would repent and believe in Him would be with Him forever. Because He says, the Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. There's an eternality to this and only an eternal God can make this eternal promise. Only an eternal God can make an eternal plan that has an eternal promise and that eternal promise is kept in all eternity. And it's only a God who has the power to make all things, to create all things, who has the power to keep and protect them. Really, the psalmist is wrapping all of these promises up in the very being of God. In the very being of God, we can know these things to be true. Even in the the understanding of His holiness. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty.
These things can be depended upon because of the very being of God and His holiness. He alone is perfect and right. The foot may slip, but it won't slip away from Him. There will be trouble and there will be evil. But He will protect you for His purpose. And even if ultimately something befalls us of great trial and trouble, He will keep our soul. The last question this morning is, when does the Lord protect His people? What are the troubles? Who is in trouble? Who will help those who are in trouble? How does the Lord help those who are in trouble? And then when? All of the time. The Lord protects His people all of the time. Every day, every night, no matter what evil surrounds them, He protects them all of the time. For us, that time is finite on this earth. But God is protecting more than just our time on this earth. He's protecting our soul. He protects us all of the time and He protects us Eternally. This from this time forth and forever. For God, He is eternal, therefore His purpose and protection is eternal. For us, we are finite, and He is protecting that uh, the immortality of the soul. That one who did not exist forever, who simply at some point had a beginning. The human being had a beginning. And yet when they were made, they were given a soul that would be immortal. The immortality of that soul is protected. For those who have repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's God who does that protecting. He does it through all of that purpose. He does it by day. He does it by night. When is it? All of the time. He does it in all circumstances. All of the time. From this time forth and forever. Well, I want to leave us with a few thoughts this morning. A few observations. Number one. Problems of the highest difficulty require help. From the highest being. Problems of the highest difficulty require help from the highest being. We have to admit the problems that we're facing today are really, in some sense, no different than the problems we faced in every day and age, in their ultimate sense. Are they different in the present sense of, of how they might have manifest themselves or, or, particular, or peculiarities of these problems? Yes. But really, ultimately, these problems are of no different. Ultimately, many of these problems are of the highest difficulty and require help from the highest being. And there is only one high being. And that is God, the God of the Bible. That is the one true living God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. If He is not our foundation, if He is not our hope, then everything else will be skewed. We can say what we want about this or that or the other issue or whatever it may be. But if He is not our firm foundation... Everything else will be skewed if we do not see him as the Lord and maker and creator of heaven and earth, the one who is all-powerful in all things, that he will not let our, our foot slip away from him. If we do not see and understand that he is the one who never sleeps nor slumbers, if we are not able to recognize that it is before him we stand as sinners, 
Part of the problem with trusting God in the great difficulties and treacheries and troubles of this world is that we don't go before him recognizing we stand before him as sinners. It is the humble, repentant sinner who sees God in this way. It is the humble, repentant sinner that bows before him, recognizing no matter what may happen, God alone is in control. To trust that he will not let our foot slip, to trust that he will neither sleep nor slumber, is to know that we are not in control and if we were, things would be in greater peril than we could even imagine. The problems of highest difficulty require help from the highest being, the one true living God. There's a second observation, though, in this that's important. We note the being of God, and in His being is His holiness. In His being is is His purpose and plan. In His being is the outworking of that. And so we must say that God does not leave us without means. God does not leave us without means. When we look at the treacheries and the troubles of the mountains, we have to be sure and understand we've not been left without means as we travail through that mountain or over that mountain. The journey is not left without the Word of God, a means that has been given to us to give us that which can comfort us, that which can give us consolation, and that also which can give us an understanding of God's purpose. It is the Word of God that will continue to encourage our trust in Him and to strengthen our faith in who He is in these troubles and difficulties. Not only is the Word of God one of these means, but prayer is one of these means. We're always thinking about what can I do? I mean, we have to admit there are times we want to fix it. What can I do? Sometimes there's not a lot we can do but pray because we don't have all the answers. Sometimes we don't even have all of the, the other means by which we could do something to affect that which is going on now. Sometimes we pray because we have to allow people or situations to be left to be worked out by other means which we can't help. So we pray and we ask the Lord for mercy. We pray and we ask the Lord to use the means which He has allowed to be invented to work appropriately. One of the means that God gives us through His Word and prayer, by the power of the Spirit, we gain wisdom. We have to understand that wisdom is a good means for us to use in times like this. Wisdom may give us an understanding of a time to press forward, but a time to be cautious. Wisdom gives us an understanding of of how to move forward in certain situations. But wisdom is guided by the very word of God and the means of prayer. Wisdom helps us know when to speak and when not to speak. Wisdom helps us to know that there are times some things don't need to be said. They're not only these means, but there are means that God gives us on the earth. God does not leave us without means to go over these treacherous mountains in the sense of what's around us. We 
said earlier that sometimes science looks at itself as an end in and of itself. And yet it only has its order because God gave the order. God created the order that is in the discovery that men uh, use and work through in science. And yet we have to be thankful for some of those means, even though scientists don't sometimes give credit where credit is due. We have to be thankful that there are means given to us in these difficulties. Let's boil it down to something of this type of illustration. If a man wanted to protect his home, would he not use the means necessary to do so? If there was someone trying to break in, there may be the means of prayer that is used. There may be the means of God's wisdom from his word that is used. But there are times when there is a robber trying to break in, we use the means around us in order. A man trying to protect his home wouldn't simply put aside a weapon because the weapon was invented by man and the invention of that weapon in and of itself may have some background that it was purely harmful. The word tells us to protect life from the sixth commandment. So wouldn't we use the means necessary to do so? Even though that means, like that weapon, probably was invented by some of them, invented by men who had purposes that weren't noble? So we have to recognize the very importance of who God is in this, and yet we also have to recognize that God does not leave us without means. There are many means that are around us, and we need to be, use them carefully. Even the very word of God can be used in a way that's inappropriate. Lastly, this morning, God does not leave us without his presence, his purpose, or his power. We're thankful for the use of means. We're thankful for the means that God gives. And yet at the same time, if we go on in our life and we only think about the means, if we only think about the things around us in that context, we will have lost sight of the greatest and biggest picture which is that God does not leave us without his presence, his power, or his purpose. God does not leave nor forsake his people because he is everywhere at once. His people, when in trouble, may trust in him. His people, when they are not in trouble, must trust in him. Because there are so many troubles around us that sometimes we don't even recognize the trouble when it's near. We must be thankful that God does not leave us without his presence. And he doesn't leave us without his purpose. All things are working together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Yes, we're thankful for the means, but sometimes the means of invention by man don't always match up with God's purpose. Sometimes the means on this earth don't deal with everything, but God has a purpose. We need to be thankful that we are ultimately in his hands. His people are in his hands. And lastly, he does not leave us without his presence, purpose, or power. God is not incapable. He's all-powerful. He's bringing his purpose to fruition. Being everywhere at once, his purpose being put forward, 
in his omnipresence and his omniscience, it is also being put forward in his omnipotence. God all-knowing, all-powerful. What man thinks he does for all of humanity, he has no idea how it is actually being worked out in the very purpose of God who created all things. We need to give glory to God for all of his many purposes or his purpose being shown to us in many ways throughout the whole of time, space, and history. But we need to be thankful and praise him that his power is behind all of it. God will not be stopped. He will not be thwarted. There is no one, no one that will stop him from protecting and keeping his people from this time forth and forever. May we give him praise today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you've been merciful to give us this time in your word. There are many weaknesses of our own bodies, our own minds, many struggles in who we are. But you do not change. You are everywhere at once, all-knowing, all-powerful, and your purpose will not be stopped. We praise you, give glory unto you, for in your holiness all these things are worked out. We have simply scratched the surface in a moment this morning of the greatness of your being and how you protect your people. I pray any small portion of this may be an encouragement, may be wisdom, thoughtfulness, And may give strength to your people in the hearing of this preaching. Well, I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll close with the reading of verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. Nevertheless, Paul wrote to Timothy... The firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. May we glory in him and seek to live in a way that is honoring unto him. All glory be unto God through his son, the Lord Jesus. Amen.